Our next speaker is going to be Dave Poston from Los Alamos. He's going to talk about NASA's uh, Space Nuclear Power Program, which he has been instrumental in making happen. We have known the need for nuclear power in space for 60 years. Uh, and uh, in particular on Mars, where solar energy is irregular, and um, but there's never been a, an actual program for it until now. And so here's the guy who's making it happen, Dave Poston. Hey, thank you. No, it's, it's exciting to be here. Um, I always I like this conference. I was at the founding conference and. Uh, Actually, back in the day, we were at the Space Nuclear Power Symposium, and I was working on plasma-cooled uh, nuclear thermal rockets, which are really cool and get you to Mars quick. But Robert was one of the guys that kind of uh, pointed out some of the problems and woke me up <laughs> with, with the concept that, you know, we need to get start doing something real. And we've been, we've been like you said, for 60 years we've known they need, need this, but the government hasn't been able to get its act together. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about, and a little bit, if I have time, to talk about the risks of radiation in space. Uh, so there is a program currently going on uh, called Kilopower. Uh, and on the left, you'll see a picture of four kilopower reactors on, on Mars uh, coupled together. So it produces about 40 kilowatts. You know, it, this would be a very bare bones first mission is, is, is what we're looking at. Uh, but you know, I, the nice thing about nuclear is power is really not our is issue at all. I mean, and I'll show it, getting to a megawatt of power isn't a big deal if, if you have the ability to land the system. I and mean, a lot of it's going to come down to what we can land and, and launch. On the right, uh, I just put this in because I was super excited to see Chris's talk about using a kilopower reactor on a, uh, on a, a, dr a driller or, or, or slush. And this is back in 2002, a uh, concept we put together was on the cover of Nuclear News, which is the, the main trade magazine for nuclear engineering, where we were powering a, a, what we call the cryobot, which is coming off the side of there to look at Mars. So, uh, so I, w I was really excited to see people starting to think about how to use the reactors uh, once we get them flown. Uh, th this is kind of an offshoot of a typical chart that's been around a long time, uh, where where you know what what space does fission reactors. Uh, uh, fill and it pretty much fills anything ambitious you want to do uh, where you don't have full-time sunlight and even then even in earth orbit there's plenty of times you'd rather have a reactor than than you know a, a huge array of solar powers to uh, panels depending on how large you got to get because our radiator is about a factor of 20 smaller than than you would need an array of solar panels uh, so so down down here at the bottom uh, oh that was cool uh, the uh, the solar uh, Solar, this, this is out at 10 AU. It's a long way out. So this is really for space science. But up here is what you theory you get if you're in sun all the time. But as Robert pointed out, you know, that we don't have a reliable source of power on uh, uh, sunlight on Mars. And it's not like dust storms there are, are survivable if you have tons of margin, right? It's a, they don't really black out the sun because of diffuse radiation. But you need about a factor of five or six more solar power power panels than you would if you, uh, if you were in the sun all the time, just to be able to survive those long storms. So it becomes excessively heavy and difficult. It's still much more difficult than the reactor to start with, but, but uh, we still want a hybrid, for sure, of, of solar and storage technology and nuclear. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of science missions right now. The radioisotope power has been used for all the, the great missions NASA's done, uh, Galileo, Cassini, Voyager, uh, to, uh, to um, explore the outer planets. But we're really, really running low on that. And there's a program to try to get some back. So maybe I want to want them to do a mission. But the first thing we think these reactors are good for is these deep space missions. And then the, also for a science NEP mission, we can take one of these reactors and put, put uh, instruments in orbits of any outer planets or outer moons you want to look at. Uh, then, then, you know, when we get to surface power for, for initial NASA missions, Grand Science NEP, there was a mission, JIMO, which basically tried to do everything at once. Uh, that, and then, uh, then uh, large human outposts, uh, you know, that, that's when we start talking the real power, when we get up to megawatts. 
Um, and then up on the top, there's, there's human propulsion, uh, which is of, always of great interest. It's a lot harder technology, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But we can evolve there with the, uh, with the um, uh, power systems. Uh, so uh, I, last year I was here, well, not here, in Pasadena, you know, talking about what happened with Krusty, which was awesome. We, you know, it, it's really been frustrating as a, as a nuclear engineer uh, no matter what field you're in in the last 40 years because the United States hasn't developed a new reactor in over 40 years, which is really hard to believe. I mean, how people think, you know, yeah, we have old power plants running and uh, maybe a few new generations of the same plant. But, uh, you know, we, we spent over a billion dollars on SP100 and GMO with no tangible results. And the DOE has spent several billions of dollars trying to develop reactors with no success. You know, and it's really just, they, the, the programs just become too expensive and don't make progress fast enough. And a, and a fair amount of that is, uh, to, regulations are insane for nuclear power, uh, which has really stifled it a lot. Um, and I might go into that a little bit when I get to my last slide. Uh, but but re really what we decided to do, I'd actually put in my papers to retire, uh, I mean, leave the laboratory. And, uh, but they came up, we were able to come up with a project we'd propose for a few hundred K, which in the government is almost nothing, uh, and, uh, and uh, do this Duff experiment to show we could actually generate some electricity with fission. And then we got NASA interested enough to do the next, the Krusty test, where we, uh, we generated a fair amount of power, uh, or at least a kilowatt. So the, the Duff, the Duff, uh, Duff experiment was our proof of concept where we took an existing criticals machine uh, for a nuclear uh, criticality, put a heat pipe in it basically, took the power out to Stirling converters and made electricity. Uh, and this was, this was really done, yeah, out, outside of NASA for the most part, except we did get guys from Glenn Research Center to contribute some hardware. Everything was off the shelf. You know, we couldn't have done it without without uh, basically begging, borrowing, stealing everywhere we could. But it was the first ever heat pipe cold fission experiment, first ever Stirling engine operation with fission heat. And the main thing was we really demonstrated we knew how this was gonna work. The physics are really simple. Uh, basically for any reactor I'm talking about in kilopower, you have um, uh, first order uh, feedback it, and where if the fuel expands, the atoms get further apart as it heats up, more neutrons leak out so your fission power goes down and vice versa. And it comes to a stable operating point, which is awesome. And that's what we showed with Krusty and really got, uh, got, got people excited. So Krusty was an actual one kilowatt reactor. That's our starting point uh, uh, for this. And, and these, the, the physical kilopower designs go from about one to maybe 20 kilowatts electric before you would change the fuel form. Um, we're using the easiest possible fuel to use, which is a metal, uh, uranium molybdenum uh, metal, uh, which they make regularly at the Y-12 security complex. And so this was an HEU-fueled system, uh, highly enriched uranium. And the, you can see the core there in the middle. You know, it's, it's four inches across, and there's three pieces that make it about a, a, a ten, 10 inches high. And that's it. So it's, it's, it's really the size of an oatmeal, but, uh, one of those uh, Quaker Oats uh, things. Uh, and, uh, but it, uh, it worked. It, we, we put heat pipes around the outside. We clamped them on. We're in a vacuum. We have to show we can get the heat across the vacuum gap. Uh, so the power went up to the Stirling engines, uh, uh, which you can see pictures of on the right. Uh, and, uh, and we made electricity. Uh, I'll go to the next slide, because it just shows more of the hardware. On the left, you see the, uh, um, let's see, which one's the laser? Well, I'll do this one still. Uh, you know, the, the uranium is underneath these clamps. These clamps were shrink uh, via interference fit put over the uh, core to clamp the heat pipes against the core to get good heat transfer. Uh, then it, the heat pipes went through to the power conversion system. This is upside down uh, because we were, we were still working on the core. And then we put it in a vacuum chamber to uh, make sure we were doing the right uh, thermal environment, plus the, the Umali fuel wouldn't tolerate operating in air at, uh, at 800 degrees Celsius, so you need it anyway. Uh, and we, we've, we've, for Mars, we'll have a, have a vessel around the, the reactor. Uh, on the left uh, here is the, uh, this is uh, beryllium, beryllium oxide, the white, 
which is what reflects the neutrons to make the system go critical uh, and get a self-sustaining uh, nuclear reaction. On the bottom is just shielding of some stainless steel and boron carbide uh, to shield the facility. We, the, 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 uh, probably the most disappointing thing was just getting enough time to operate. They, this, is, uh, this is a weapons facility in, in, in large uh, amount, and uh, they didn't want us to activate the room with neutrons because they do some really detailed science in this room. So we, we negotiated to get uh, 28 hours of full power run on this thing, which is way more than they'd ever done. I mean, uh, uh, and, um, and, and it worked. Uh, so uh, this, this was cool, um, just, and I'm not gonna try to go through the physics, I'm just putting it up to, to show it, and maybe there's a couple of nuclear engineers in the house, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, 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 you know, on the right, so the HEU, that's again our stack of uranium, and it's just cool to think about that's where the power is generated, right? I mean, you, you think of power needing f fuel and oxidizer or something, the power is just generated in that metal, uh, and in this case, four kilowatts of uh, po thermal power to produce one kilowatt of electricity. Um, and, but this first test we did was super important because it basically showed the physics we needed to show, and what we did with the regulator, I mean, uh, the DOE is our regulator on the government side versus NRC uh, for the commercial side, but they both are essentially the same um, in terms of the rules they follow, and, and they didn't have the ability to, to model this system, right? And that's one of our big problems with, with NRC, too. They, when we're trying to build up these new reactors, they don't really have the capability to, to model and understand new concepts that people throw at them. So what we did with the regulator is we, uh, we convinced them, listen, we're going to predict every step along the way. And if we are able to predict those, will you let us go to the next step? And so we made gates. They agreed because, uh, yeah, if you, it, this system looks simple and we, we kind of agree with you it should be easy uh, and predictable. But so this was, this was the final test before the full power run where we predicted we would come to 400 degrees C uh, reactor temperature with, with the uh, with the oscillation period we show, and that we got through the final regulatory approval to go to the final test. Uh, this is the coolest part of the kilopower systems in first, well, not first order, but close to first order of most nuclear reactors is they are stable load following systems. Uh, and what what you see on the top is the the core thermocouples. The core stand at 800 degrees C the whole time. Uh, and on the right is power, and so we're, we're going along at steady state, in this case, at about 2.7 kilowatts. We reduce the stroke on the Stirling engine so less power is taken out, and uh, the power immediately drops and settles to the power that's being drawn from the system. So throughout this whole transient sequence, we, we don't do anything to reactor controls. So you don't need a reactor control system except to start up and get to temperature. You're basically, you're setting the thermostat because uh, the reactor, due to its physics, wants to stay at a specific temperature to keep the chain reaction at one. If, it, if, the, if the, you start making more power, it heats up, more neutrons leak out, the power comes down, and vice versa. And that's what's going on here. You can see the little waves up on top of temperature going up and down. That, that's the reactor responding to the change in power. So we can go from two to four kilowatts here uh, without needing to control the reactor, which is really nice. Uh, um, and because uh, diagnostics are difficult. And so now the Stirling control system basically controls the reactor. How much power do you want? We also did a transients where we looked at the, the uh, failure of a heat pipe uh, or a Stirling engine. Uh, you know, and, and everything was as predicted that we get a hot spot in the core, but we design it so we can tolerate at least two of these failures to, and still produce full power. There's a trade there with how much excess radiator you want and, and, and such, but uh, we can make it as redundant as, as NASA would want, uh, depending on, you know, a mass, mass penalty, essentially. So right now we're, we're looking at a fair amount of concepts. We have our one kilowatt system, which was actually what Krusty tested. Uh, there's a lot more interest in 10 kilowatts, obviously for surface missions uh, uh, to do something cool. Uh, but one kilowatt, would, anything would be great as far as I'm concerned. And right, right now we're looking, when I say we, NASA, uh, uh, you know, at, at a lunar lander of uh, one of our reactors, but it's, it's the same thing. 
So it would be a demonstration whether it was for the moon or Mars. And frankly, I, I just want to get us going in terms of power and space. Because everything we talk about, you know, almost every talk you probably hear at this conference, it's like the relying on power, right? I mean, that's, that's the one thing. It's kind of your lifeline. It's, it's without power, you're not doing anything, staying alive, let alone doing science. Uh, so so we, we've, got the, uh, we've got architectures for all these things that are all rooted in crusty and, uh, and uh, up, evolving up to a megawatt. Uh, this is just a slide that shows some of the shielding configurations. We, first, first, first time we come in, the shielding is the orange around this thing. Uh, and the reactor, you know, is this little bitty thing in, the, in, the, in between the reflector. You, it's hard to see. But, uh, so we look at leaving it on the lander, which until you get your architecture there to move stuff around, but you pay about twice as much of the shielding mass to protect either people or, uh, or your electronics. You can place it on the surface, and you can kind of just see how we don't need the lower shield. The, the big problem with operating on a surface versus space is space you can use a shadow shield, right? And radiation's not going to scatter off the vacuum and around. But when you're on the surface, you always got to worry about uh, scattering. And actually, Mars is better than the moon in terms of how much it scatters. But uh, and, then, and then eventually we'd like to bury these things where we really minimize the amount of uh, shield mass. Uh, of course, the best answer is, of course, and we're getting better at it, is, is landing the system uh, su such that there's a ridge or some, you know, a topography or crater lift that keep between where you want to be and where the reactor is. And, and that should be pretty doable because I think we're getting better at where we're going to land and orient and all that. And you can also create berms and fill them sandbags. One, one of the things we found, which was actually kind of a surprise, is that the Mars atmosphere is almost the worst case density for sky shine, what we'd call sky shine, uh, where it, uh, the mean free path of a, a neutron is about a kilometer at, at Mars. So if you're a kilometer away or two kilometers away or wherever you are, there's one scatter to get the radiation to you. It's not a huge deal, but it, it was just kind of, it's kind of an interesting academic fact, but we do need to shield, kind of prevent scatter off the atmosphere. On Earth, the atmosphere is thick enough that if there was a huge reactor a kilometer away, none of the radiation would get to you. Uh, th this is looking at the deployment of some of these systems. Uh, the, we have an umbrella radiator that comes up. Uh, there's a picture of a, a system on the moon, a one kilowatt on the moon, or a 10 kilowatt there on Mars. That's the see the one we placed. The one on the lower right is four kilopower reactors on a lander on Mars, uh, and that's kind of our, our base, one of our baselines for the first mission that would provide 40 kilowatts of electricity. We've also looked at an ISRU demo mission. Uh, you know, uh, the this one was a while ago, and I'd, I'd hope they bring it back. This one actually needed a lot of shielding because we were leaving the ISRU plant in situ research utilization. I, I assume most of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, so to make propellant or oxygen or or, uh, or other other chemicals you might want uh, in those two bo purple boxes, and we 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 had to shield at least to get our dose low enough so that those components could work, and we we actually. We still would kind of need to talk to whoever's developing ISRU components. We wouldn't put our electronics right there. We would, we would, the electronics are usually up on a, a mast or, or driven away to, so we can use off the shelf uh, electronics because they, they generally want to go down to 25K rad, uh, kilorads of uh, energy and to shield to that so something right next door would take a lot of mass. But again, if you can, if you can use sandbags or your, uh, a you know, native material to shield, then maybe that's not that big of a deal. Uh, this is just this chart that I like to show that you can't read, but it's uh, <laughs> the uh, the uh, it's basically how long is the reactor operated versus how long has it been shut down? When is it safe to approach? Uh, generally, you know, when the, the reactor is operating, we'll be shielding it such that the people to habitat are getting less than the background radiation, and when they're in their habitat. Uh, I mean, we're not, out in EVA, they'll be getting less than background. When they're in a habitat, they'll be well shielded from the reactor. That's the one good thing about reactor radiation is it's a lot easier to shield than galactic cosmic rays. Uh, so we, we, uh, we only need like a few inches of aluminum 
to knock down almost all the, the, the gamma radiation coming from the system. So it really just shows that if you've, if you're operated for eight years, let's say you've operated as, you know, full, uh, for a long time, you know, we, what, what it would take to approach the system. And generally after a day, you're getting to typical maintenance operations at nuclear power plants. Um, um, and even right away, you could go up within 100 seconds and be in a place where uh, you would be near uh, what, what we consider the mission critical ops. So, so you can approach the system um, and you could even approach it while it's operating for a short amount of time. You know, it's all, it's all an integrated dose how long you're, uh, you're in the field. Uh, this chart basically shows the impact of uh, uh, the, the uh, different architectures versus left on lander, placed on surface, buried a hole. And really, what the bottom line is the, the watts per kilogram we can get out. You know, they're, they're still not, this is still a bare bones, uh, like, Model T reactor, right? Is this is something to get something done. And it's, uh, it's not as sporty as we can do, but we've tried to do sporty for 40 years and not gotten anywhere, right? So, and this, this is still light enough to be used. Um, and so it's not, uh, later we could get more, more power for less mass, but, um, you know, a lot, there's a lot of trades between high voltage, low voltage transmission. This is all low voltage, even to two kilometers, which, which, uh, makes the cable mass pretty high. Um, the, um, the looking at where we are and where we've tried to go. Uh, on this chart, if you can see it, uh, there's, there's green boxes, which are reactors that have been built, but all of them uh, built and designed back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, um, Krusty is there on the left, you know, a pretty, pretty high outlet temperature to get a good efficiency, because we want to keep our radiator down, but low power. And then the 10 kilowatt, kilopowers on there there's actually, I put a couple of four and eight megawatt reactors with decreasing alphas, which might be good for uh, nuclear electric propulsion missions. But often the far right is, is nuclear thermal propulsion. And it's, it's, it's amazing what they did back in the, in the 60s uh, with Rover and Nerva, because they, they were like the superheroes of nuclear engineering. And it's kind of fun to think about. But they, they had 12 ground tests, and we're still a long way from succeeding. And it's really going to take an Apollo-like effort from the government to try to do new nuclear thermal propulsion and make it work. Uh, you know, and you put it on a linear scale, you see the, the power densities, how, how out of the normal for uh, reactors that is. And the, don't, don't try to read this, except I like to show it because how we can evolve to these systems we want, right? Kilopower generations, uh, we're at right now, uh, zero we've demonstrated, one we're working on now, you know, are, are pretty heavy, alpha the kilogram per kilowatts, you know, are, are pretty high, but they're extremely low risk. So I, I put this chart together to kind of put risks on all the uh, possible systems for nuclear thermal rockets. And then uh, up on the top chart, you get down to something that like Franklin Chang Diaz would use for Vasimir, you know, if you, you know of a, uh, uh, a five, uh, alpha of five or three. It, it's gonna take several iterations to get there, but it can be done. We can, but we can get to two megawatts in an alpha of 15 very easily. And so for any, any surface application, I think we're fine, but for the nuclear propulsion, you need this good stuff. Uh, I want a, a couple more slides. The, uh, the uh, space reactor safety is something I always wanna point out. Uh, you know, this uranium is not radioactive at launch. You, you hold it in your hands, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and um, so it's, it's, you know, four orders of magnitude less radioactive than the plutonium we already launch, right? And, you know, there'll be protests no matter what, of course. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's the safety case is very good. Uh, full aerosation of the core in a launch explosion uh, it will still be hundreds of times less background dose at the site boundary. Uh, after it's fission, that it's radioactive. Um, and, uh, you know, and, but I think even on Mars, you know, the fact that it works is going to be more important than, than a release. I, we, we haven't really looked at how, what would happen if there was a release of radioactivity from a reactor on Mars. If it's buried, 
it's not going anywhere and there's there's I mean it's it's going to be a very small issue but that, that's something that needs to be looked at so the bottom line for space fission power is uh, um, you know we showed we that that nuclear power for space is not inherently expensive if you if you keep it simple and uh, so uh, you know, we, we did the first test of a nuclear reactor power system for in 50 years, and we need to take manageable steps, I think, to get to where we want to go. Um, and that's that's hard to convince even myself, right? Because I want to work on the cool, you know, the fancy. Let's let's do something that really performs well. But it's hard it's hard to keep the engineers from getting excited, and of course the managers and everything. So yeah, uh, so it'll take several steps. Uh, now, the, I've got one minute, so I'm using my if time slide. I, the, my, the thing I really dislike is, is how everyone makes a huge deal about radiation to astronauts. And it's it just kind of become this, this thing every time you see it on the news or CNN, it's like, oh, we have to solve the radiation problem. Um, you know, so in, and I just threw this together last night, so it's like not in very good uh, uh, shape. But basically, we're, we're limiting the, the dose to, to well, the, the natural dose of an astronaut will get during a three-year mission, we'll give them according to a bogus model, but that we'll even assume the model's okay, it's called the linear no threshold model, uh, that they'll have a 3% chance of premature death due to cancer, likely later in their life. All right, so, so all of this, you know, but any true explorer would be actually thrilled with this outcome. I mean. We, we'd, uh, I, I mean, I'd sign up for a 50% uh, ch ch chance of cons. I mean, think of how valuable your life is. I mean, if you, if you help do this. So, uh, uh, you know, and so, you know, I think the stance is pathetic, uh, you know, that we benefited greatly. I mean, somebody brought up the Mayflower. I'm sure glad they came over, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, I mean, I, th I, think, I think we should be willing to take risks. And if we send people there and they have trouble, then... That's what happens, uh, uh, you know. But but if you do the math, the, the the irony is that a mission to Mars will save the astronaut from dying from cancer, uh, because it, we're doing, I mean, uh, trajectory burns, launch, capture, landing, ascent, docking, entry burns. Every one of those, we'll be doing a great job if each of those is a one percent chance of failure. Uh, so you you do the math, and it's you know. Uh, the first astronauts out there are probably going to have at least a 25% chance of dying before they get home. And it, 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 it better be, or we're never going to get there. Um, and we'll have plenty of people willing to do that. Um, uh, I think there'll be no problem with that. So it's really, you know, it, it, this is just the dumb math, but it's uh, you have a 25% chance of dying from cancer if you're a human being living in the United States. Uh, so if there's a 20% acute mission of uh, mission to do death, your chance goes down to 22 percent. So it's it's of course it's it's kind of asinine, but uh, it's trying to make the point that radiation is a minor risk, and like our predecessors, we need to focus on the great things we can do for ourselves and future generations. And if we try to exhaust every possible risk, we're never going to achieve anything great. So thank you. Yeah, he asked about thorium molten salt reactors, and that that's that's a, they're going to be super heavy. Uh, but once you can start mining thorium on Mars, you could start looking at it. But that's that's so far down the road. It's the kind of thing I don't like us to focus on right now. That it's. It's the, the, the how, what the size of the simplest fission reactor, which is crusty. Yeah, it's the, the fuel is this big, the reactor is this big. Uh, well, the reactor core is this big, including the reflectors. And then you throw the power system on, and it's like a meter and a half, and in about 50 centimeters wide. Yeah. I don't know.
<laughs> yeah, he's asking. He's asking about highly enriched uranium versus low enriched uranium. Yeah, and there's a ton of thought. Actually, there's a huge policy meeting that was yesterday, which I'm afraid to hear the answer on because because I'm pretty sure they're going to say they they don't want us using highly enriched uranium. The good news is for surface power, it's not that big of a issue, especially as you go to higher powers. It really hurts the one kilowatt system because you're criticality limited. You'd, you basically need 10 times as much uranium. So your mass of your, your fuel goes from 30 kilograms to 300 kilograms. Uh, but the rest of the system stays about the same mass. Uh, and uh, for nuclear thermal rockets, it makes it almost impossible, uh, which, which – because uh, back in the day, they were testing the, the highly enriched ones. So it's uh, – but that's a poly decision that, that NASA and Congress and everyone's struggling with right now. All right, thank you.